When you think about seizures, they result from episodic electrical discharges in cerebral neurons. Essentially, we're talking about those neurons that are rapidly firing. So when we cover strategies as anti-epileptics, these are going to be drugs that are going to stop neuronal firing. All of the mechanisms we are about to discuss have a CNS depressant effect to stop that sustained high-frequency repetitive firing that occurs in seizures. There are four major mechanisms of action for anticonvulsants. When we look at each of these, remember, they're all CNS depressants stopping that neuronal firing as we previously discussed. The first mechanism is blocking sodium channels. The drugs carbamazepine and phenytoin do this very effectively. A second mechanism, since GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, drugs which facilitate the actions of GABA are going to have an anticonvulsant effect. That's how barbiturates work, and that's how benzodiazepines will work. The third mechanism involves blocking the actions of glutamate. Remember that glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So drugs that block glutamate receptors like lamotrigine, topiramate, or felbamate are going to have an anticonvulsant effect. There are different types of glutamate receptors. Some of those are mentioned here in the text. AMPA receptors and NMDA, those are receptors for glutamate that are blocked by various drugs. Our fourth and final mechanism would be to block presynaptic calcium channels. Blocking those type T channels, which are found in high concentration in thalamic neurons. This is how ethosuximide works, and it's one of the mechanisms by which valproic acid is going to work. Here we have a table that looks at the different types of seizures and possible drugs of choice. Really, it's just a list of effective drugs because very rarely do we have a clear-cut drug of choice for the different types of seizures. In fact, I want to focus you on two things in particular on this table. First is absent seizures. I believe this is the most likely seizure for you to be asked to treat on your Step 1 exam. The drug ethosuximide, very, very popular as a choice for absent seizures. Valproic acid can also work, but many times ethosuximide is the first drug used. You can recognize this patient with absent seizures because they experience impaired consciousness, typically for a very brief period of time. This occurs in kids who stare off blankly into space. Essentially, they zone out before they come back and return to normal activity. Again, ethosuximide is a great drug for that condition. A second type of seizure that you might be asked to treat on your Step 1 exam, status epilepticus. IV benzodiazepines are preferred for this condition, so IV lorazepam or IV diazepam are typically used, with phenytoin or phosphenytoin, a metabolite, that can be used. When you think about treatment of partial seizures, whether that be simple or complex partial, or general tonic-clonic seizures, there are a number of drugs that are effective. So I wouldn't consider any one of these a drug of choice. However, I would make note of the fact that valproic acid can be used in multiple seizure types. And that's how I would describe that drug. Valproic acid is the most multi-purpose seizure medication that we have. Be aware that if you have a patient who has absent seizures and another type of seizure, if they have more than one seizure type, most often that is a valproic acid question. If it's absence in something else, you cannot use ethosuximide as the sole drug. If you wanted a single drug, that would be a great option where you would use valproic acid. Next, we're going to look at our, ind at our individual drugs, and that would include phenytoin. It's a sodium channel blocker. The table mentioned that it can be used in a couple of different types of seizures, including partial as well as general tonic-clonic seizures. If you look over at the kinetics of this drug, when you think about the pharmacokinetics of phenytoin, it has some interesting properties that are worth noting. When we say the word nonlinear kinetics, are you comfortable with that? Do you remember from back in general principles? Phenytoin is one of those three drugs that follows zero-order kinetics. Zero-order kinetics. 
but it only does this at high therapeutic doses. The lower doses of phenytoin, you're going to see first order elimination. Remember that first order was the rule and zero order was the exception. Can you recall the other two drugs that undergo zero order kinetics? Besides phenytoin, it would be ethanol and aspirin. That's your zero P's. Those are the drugs that undergo zero order kinetics, typically at the high to the overdose range. Phenytoin is also an inducer of P450 enzymes. We also covered that back in general principles as part of our mnemonic. When you look at the side effects for phenytoin, the first one is CNS depression. But this is going to be a universal side effect for our anticonvulsants. All of them have a CNS depressant effect. Let's look for a few outstanding features for this drug. Gingival hyperplasia is one. Gingival hyperplasia, red, thick, swollen gums. Perhaps the patient complains of their gums growing down over their teeth, or perhaps their gums are bleeding. Gingival hyperplasia is a classic side effect of phenytoin, but it can also occur with other drugs. We had previously discussed dopamine calcium channel blockers back in section three. Those types of drugs can also cause gingival hyperplasia. You might also recall one of our immunosuppressant drugs, cyclosporin, can do the same thing. A second side effect of phenytoin to note, hirsutism, and a third would be osteomalacia. You see, phenytoin interferes with vitamin D metabolism, inhibiting the actions of vitamin D. And if I put those three things together, once again, exaggerate the side effects to make them memorable, you've got a very interesting person here with red, thick, swollen gums, they're very hairy, and they have weak bones due to this action on vitamin D metabolism. We also remember that phenytoin is teratogenic. It's category D in pregnancy. It's a known teratogen that can cause cleft lip and cleft palate. Carbamazepine is a drug that is very, very similar to phenytoin. It has the same mechanism. When it comes to its use in various types of seizures, it's used exactly the same way as phenytoin. It also shares the pharmacokinetic property of being a P450 inducer. Phenytoin and carbamazepine, very similar drugs. But when I think about differences, carbamazepine is the one of those two that's likely to be used for a trigeminal neuralgia. It's a drug of choice for trigeminal neuralgia, which is a condition also known as tic douloureux. It's a problem with the fifth cranial nerve where the patient experiences intense stabbing facial pain. Some people have referred to this condition as the most painful disease known. This intense stabbing facial pain, very, very challenging to treat. Most commonly, we're going to use the sodium channel blocker carbamazepine for that condition. We can also use carbamazepine as an alternative drug in bipolar disorder. And collectively, that means carbamazepine is more likely to be used than phenytoin in various conditions. The side effects for carbamazepine are also going to remind us to some extent of phenytoin. But I'm going to highlight megaloblastic and aplastic anemia as side effects for carbamazepine. And also the fact that it can increase ADH secretion, causing a possible dilutional hyponatremia. These are side effects more likely to occur with carbamazepine compared to phenytoin. There's also a risk of Stevens-Johnson syndrome. This is a syndrome that we will discuss in more detail in section five as we discuss antibiotics and specifically sulfonamides, but carbamazepine can be a causative agent for this condition. Similar to phenytoin, carbamazepine is teratogenic. It's category D in pregnancy, can cause cleft lip and cleft palate, and also there's a, light, a slight risk of spina bifida. Our next drug is valproic acid. It's really unlikely that you're going to get a mechanism of action question on this drug on your step one exam. It's because this drug has multiple mechanisms of action. Similar to phenytoin, it blocks sodium channels. Similar to ethosuximide, it blocks T-type calcium channels. It can also inhibit GABA transaminase, 
perhaps facilitating the further action of GABA. So its multiple mechanisms make it a multi-purpose seizure drug, but it doesn't make for a very clean step one question. As we've seen earlier, valproic acid can be used for a wide variety of seizures. Some people even use the term broad spectrum. It's a broad spectrum anticonvulsant. In fact, I would say it like this. If you don't know what to use to treat their seizure, give them valproic acid. It's that broad spectrum. It works in most type of seizures, and especially in patients who have more than one type of seizure. Valproic acid is a great alternative to lithium for the mania of bipolar disorder. It's one of our many options for migraine prophylaxis as well. I will mention that it's a P450 inhibitor, but also tell you it's not a major inhibitor of P450 enzymes. There are not going to be very many drug interactions that you need to worry about with this drug, but it does distinguish valproic acid from the other drugs we've covered, phenytoin and carbamazepine, both of which were P450 inducers. There are definitely some testable side effects for valproic acid hepatotoxicity that can occur due to a toxic metabolite of valproic acid. This is more likely to occur in very young kids. Kids aged two or less are the ones that are most at risk for liver damage from this drug. There's also a very slight risk of pancreatitis with valproic acid, but definitely something you want to highlight and be aware of for your step one exam. Similar to the first two drugs we covered, Valproic acid is teratogenic. Category D in pregnancy, of all of our anticonvulsants, it's the one that has the greatest risk of causing spina bifida. Perhaps one of your favorite anticonvulsants for your step one exam is ethosuximide. It's a drug that you have to know two very basic things about. You have to know how it works. It blocks T-type calcium channels, and you have to know that it has one use and that is absent seizures. Be prepared for questions on this drug. The drug lamotrigine has become very, very popular as an anticonvulsant. Like valproic acid, it has multiple mechanisms of action, including it blocks sodium channels and it blocks glutamate receptors. That makes this drug a multi-purpose drug as well that can be used in various seizure states. Similar to carbamazepine that we covered earlier, this drug can also cause Stevens-Johnson syndrome. The drug levetiracetam. We really don't fully understand the mechanism of this drug, though it has become a popular drug for focal onset and generalized tonic-clonic seizures. We mentioned this drug in the text because of its popular use, but again, it will not make for a good mechanism question on the test. Topiramate is another of the drugs that has multiple actions. It blocks sodium channels, it blocks glutamate receptors, and also enhances GABA activity. Once again, this drug can be used in a variety of seizures, including focal seizures in adults and children age greater than two. We can even use topiramate in migraine prophylaxis. The drug felbamate blocks sodium channels and glutamate receptors. And while this drug potentially can be used in a wide variety of seizures, it is very much limited by the side effect of aplastic anemia. Because of this side effect and the severity, I would put felbamate at the bottom of my list of options as an anticonvulsant, but it does make for a very good step one question. Gabapentin and a related drug called pregabalin. These can be used as anticonvulsants. It affects calcium channels, perhaps also affecting neurotransmitter release. We believe that this action is presynaptic, by the way. If you block presynaptic calcium channels and you inhibit neurotransmitter release, obviously you can depress the action of neurons, and that can be a very effective anticonvulsant mechanism. Probably the actions of this drug on GABA are very, very minimal in terms of contributions to their anticonvulsant effects. Besides using gabapentin in seizures, it's very commonly used as a treatment for neuropathic pain, including postherpetic neuralgia. In fact, this is where the drug has kind of found a home. It is the most popular treatment for neuropathic pain. 
When we think about general features of anticonvulsants, they are CNS depressants. So they're going to have additive effects with other CNS depressants, benzos, barbs, opioids, antihistamines, for example. You don't want to abruptly withdraw anticonvulsants because that can precipitate seizures. Now, watch out for this third point, decreased efficacy of oral contraceptives. That's happening due to induction of P450 enzymes. Can you identify which anticonvulsants might reduce the effect of oral contraceptives? Sure, that would be phenytoin, carbamazepine, and phenobarbital. Those are drugs that we covered back in general principles as we were reviewing drug metabolism, and all of those fit into our list of P450 inducers. They're going to reduce the effectiveness of oral contraceptives. So in a patient who's taking an oral contraceptive in one of these anticonvulsants, you would recommend an additional form of birth control. Of course, if the woman were to get pregnant while taking phenytoin or carbamazepine, her fetus would be at risk for the possible teratogenic effects of these drugs.